Hello, beloveds, and welcome to Christian Emotional Recovery, a podcast for those who are survivors of childhood trauma, emotional neglect, and narcissistic abuse. This podcast is hosted by Rachel Leroy, a college professor and trauma survivor. Many of us spend years trying to heal and don't get anywhere. We don't always target the trauma itself, which is so often what keeps us stuck. This podcast is where faith meets science. Rachel is an emotional healing expert with 20 years of experience applying healing modalities that helped her start making progress after nothing else worked. She'll show you how to do the same. Each week, we'll cover a topic that will show you how to heal trauma for good. Please check out our website and show notes at christianemotionalrecovery.com and join the Facebook community, Trauma Survivors Unite Christian Emotional Recovery. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 7 of Christian Emotional Recovery. And in this episode, we are continuing the series on narcissistic abuse, What You Need to Know About Narcissistic Abuse, Part 2. We are continuing the series in Season 2, Episode 7, Series on Narcissistic Abuse, What You Need to Know About Narcissistic Abuse, Part 2. So let's go ahead and get started and continue this series from last time, which was Season 2, Episode 6, Series on Narcissistic Abuse, What You Need to Know About Narcissistic, what you need to know about narcissistic Abuse, Part 1. Now, the next section talks about... What are the general impacts of narcissistic abuse on the survivor? What are the general impacts of narcissistic abuse on the survivor? Now, some of those impacts could be post-traumatic stress disorder or trauma, CPTSD, which is complex trauma or complex post-traumatic stress disorder. It could be psychological. It could be personal. It can have physical impacts, and it can also have impacts on one's relationships, on a person's job, on every area of their life. Codependency is another possibility, and we'll get into what those are and how narcissistic abuse can create those impacts on someone who is a victim or a survivor, I like to call them, of narcissistic abuse. So let's look at some articles. Like I said, these sections on narcissism and narcissistic abuse are very resource heavy. And these podcasts are resource heavy because this requires a lot of terminology, a lot of research. And I want to back up what I'm saying with reputable sources. So you know I'm not just making this stuff up. I do share some personal experiences, even if they're general or vague. But I also want to make sure that what I'm sharing is accurate and based in research and organized in a way that you can understand it. So the effects of narcissistic abuse. I'm going back to an article that I had pulled last episode, Effects of Narcissistic Abuse by Arlen Kuhnkick. It was the very first article that I pulled and used in the last episode talking about narcissistic abuse and educating you on the overall topic. But let's go look at the impacts. Now, last time I gave you the definition of narcissistic abuse, so we'll go ahead and jump straight into what are some of the impacts of narcissistic abuse. And these are not all of them. These are more the emotional impacts. Obviously, these emotional impacts will have repercussions in terms of your relationships or if you were emotionally neglected, another form of emotional abuse, that will have other kinds of impacts, and so forth and so on. If you were physically abused, also some of these impacts may be here as well as others. But we're talking about narcissistic abuse, and one of the primary relationships where that occurs that has the most impact is parent-to-child or caretaker to child. And we'll get into that unique relationship in just a little bit. But let's look at what are the impacts. First one in the Very Well Mind article, it says, is anxiety. 
Many narcissistic abuse survivors live with anxiety. After experiencing narc abuse, you may experience extreme fear or anxiety in relationships with new people. Those who leave abusive relationships may experience separation anxiety, leading them to feel panicked and disoriented when they're not with their abusers. Um, some of the symptoms can include anxiety attacks, panic attacks, or hypervigilance after being abused by a narcissist. Know that these symptoms will ease over time, particularly if you work through your trauma with a professional and on your own, but you definitely need to get help from a professional if that's a possibility for you. Now, um, hypervigilance is a term basically meaning where you're alert all the time and you're looking for something to happen. It's almost like paranoia, but not exactly, and it's not your fault. If you've been abused, hypervigilance is a normal reaction. The second impact of narcissistic abuse is depression. And it says many people who have experienced narcissistic abuse also develop depression. Survivors often struggle with feelings of worthlessness after months or years of being told how useless and stupid they are by their abuser. After years of being manipulated and gaslighted, you may also isolate yourself, which can make feelings of depression worse. Post-traumatic stress. I added CPTSD to this. Now, that's not in this article, but I'm going to add a little note here of my own in just a second. Post-traumatic stress. As a narcissist abuse survivor, you will likely have symptoms of PTSD or post-traumatic stress. Your brain will be on high alert. That's hypervigilance or fight or flight, looking out for danger. This is because the traumatic events triggered fight or flight response within you. As a result, anything associated with those memories can trigger an anxiety attack. After experiencing narcissistic abuse, you may feel the need to be on guard 24-7. Um, and it goes on here. But uh, post-traumatic stress, if you were in a situation where you had this happen to you chronically, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, especially when you were a child, but you don't have to be a child, you may have complex trauma. And complex trauma is where it impacts every area of your life all the time. It's not just in specific situations or circumstances. And um, I talked a little bit about the difference between PTSD and CPTSD in one of my YouTube videos. So um, if you want to know more about that, um, I'm not going to go into detail here, but you can learn more about the difference between regular trauma and complex trauma. If you go look for the um, video with that title, what's the difference between PTSD and CPTSD, and go to Christian Emotional Recovery, my YouTube channel called Christian Emotional Recovery, hit click watch the video, subscribe. There's a lot of good stuff there too that's not in the podcast that's exclusive to the YouTube channel. So check it out. Now, a loss of sense of self and self-worth is another impact. You may feel as you, if you've completely lost yourself. Narcissistic abuse is a form of brainwashing and as such can destroy your sense of self-worth. You may no longer feel like the person you were before all this began, or if it happened in childhood, you may not even know who you are. In many cases, those who have experienced narcissistic abuse will struggle to recognize themselves in the mirror because they no longer see their true reflection staring back at them. You may also have trust issues with other people, especially those closest to you, and constantly find yourself doubting or second-guessing yourself. And it goes on. The next one, inability to forgive yourself. Isn't that sad? Something happened to you that wasn't your fault. Somebody did it to you, and they're the ones that caused it. And then you're the one that can't forgive yourself. It's so unfair, and it sucks, and it's not your fault. But that is one of the realities of narcissistic abuse. After experiencing narc abuse, many victims struggle with feeling unworthy or believing that they deserve how the narcissist treated them. Nobody deserves that. It may feel like there must be something inherently wrong with you if someone was supposed to love you unconditionally, use their power against you in such cruel ways. I would argue that's especially true if that happened to you when you were a child, ongoing, by a parent or a caretaker. You might struggle with low self-esteem and believe that the narcissistic abuser would have treated you better if only you had done things differently. 
That is so harsh, but it's that's there it is. You may also have trouble focusing on your goals and dreams. This could be because you're still preoccupied with thoughts of what happened to you, or it could be your sense of self-worth is so damaged, it's difficult for you to believe that anything good can happen in your life anymore, What is a, which is a load of crap. Good things can happen. God loves you, and He gave you a life, and He wants you to live a life that He intended for you to live, and that's why the healing is so important. Another um, impact of narcissistic abuse, physical symptoms. I have chronic conditions, several chronic conditions, and it's because of my background with narcissistic abuse. I attribute it to that. And PTSD and CPTSD will mess with your body. That's why in Chinese medicine, the body and the mind are considered one thing. And I would argue that they've got it right. The body and mind really can't be separated. One impacts the other, and the other impacts one. One impacts one, and the other impacts the other. So it says, after experiencing narcissistic abuse, you may live with physical symptoms, including headaches, stomach aches, or body aches. Oh gosh, a lot more than that. Um, chronic conditions that you can, any chronic condition that you can name, because it, it impacts your, when your body's under stress all the time, when you're under fight or flight all the time, those cortisol and adrenal hormones are going and going and going and releasing and releasing and releasing. So you may deal with issues with with anxiety and with depression and with your immune system and with um, fight or flight and with um, having cortisol in your body all the time and that strain, your body can't keep up with it and it has an impact and you can get diabetes and you can get IBS and you can get Crohn's disease and you can get fibromyalgia and chronic pain and nerve conditions and all of these things and it sucks and again, it's not fair but it is an impact of narcissistic abuse. And again, I believe that you can do a lot of therapies that can greatly change and greatly heal the emotional. And some of that physical stuff will automatically self-correct. And you can also get a lot of therapies and do a lot of lifestyle changes that can help you deal with those conditions and in some cases even heal them. Taking vitamins, praying and meditating, getting plenty of exercise, sunshine, walking, getting outside, having a social life of some kind, interacting with healthy and loving people reading your Bible, meditation, EFT, all these healing strategies that I talk about in a healthy lifestyle, getting the right nutrients, eating healthy, drinking a lot of water, all of those things make such a big difference. And it says you may ha have difficulty sleeping after experiencing narcissistic abuse. You may be stressed about what happened and find it difficult to shut off your brain at night. Or you could end up having nightmares that haunt you for days afterwards. I would say Longer than that in some cases. Cognitive problems. Cognitive problems is another one. Um, if you've listened to my podcast, if you know anything about PTSD or narcissistic abuse, you know that it impacts the wiring of your brain. But we're also learning through neuroplasticity that your brain can be rewired. It's hard as an adult, but it can be done. It says, after narcissistic abuse, it may become difficult for you to concentrate on everyday tasks, such as completing work or just watching TV. Memories of traumatic events are known to interfere with concentration and focus. They're intrusive. You may experience memory loss, especially short term. This is because the brain releases a surge of stress hormones when traumatized, affecting the hippocampus region of the brain. Emotional lability, L-A-B-I-L-I-T-Y, is another impact. Emotional lability. After going through a traumatic event, this article says, such as narcissistic abuse, it's common to suffer from sudden mood swings accompanied by irritability, or you may find yourself feeling emotionless and like a robot. One is when you get into that um, sympathetic fight or flight state. The other one is when you get into that vagal state of shutting down or disconnecting, also known as disassociation. You might experience depersonalization where you feel like everything around you is not accurate. 
That's also where grounding is helpful, where you get back into the body, you feel real. You may not feel real. You may feel disembodied in some ways. And so that's where grounding exercises are so helpful. I feel more real. I feel like I'm more in my body. I feel like a real person. I feel more whole, like I'm inside of my body looking out. And I didn't feel that way before I do, did all those grounding exercises. And it really can make such a huge difference. Now, effects on children, it says. It says if you have children who have witnessed narcissistic abuse, they could also be at risk of developing mental health problems such as PTSD, anxiety disorders, or depression. They might become fearful in situations that remind them of their traumatic experiences. They might feel angry at your spouse or the world if they're the ones causing it, feel disconnected from other people, or have low self-esteem and confidence issues. Low self-worth. After experiencing narcissistic abuse, you might feel like you don't even know yourself anymore. You could start questioning your self-worth, have trust issues with other people, etc., etc. Stuck in a cycle. That's another impact. Stuck in a cycle. After experiencing narc abuse, many people find themselves stuck in a cycle where their abuser continues to contact them after the relationship has ended. They may act nice, also called hoovering. Remember that from the last episode? Hoovering. In an attempt to get you to come back, issue threats, or attempt to manipulate you by making you feel sorry for them. Don't fall for it. We as Christians are not obligated to be manipulated by people. It's one thing to be kind, but you have a right to set boundaries and protect yourself. And keep in mind that that person has moral obligations to treat you right as well. And if they're not, you have a right to put your foot down and set a boundary. Enough, no more. If somebody's hoovering and this is the third, fifth, or twelfth time that they've said they're going to change or they're going to do better and they haven't, walk on. Walk on. No matter how hard it is, you will be better off in the long run to walk away and never look back. This can be a tactic, it says, used by narcissists to keep their victims trapped in a cycle of abuse. It's so sad, but that does happen. Trust issues. After experiencing narc abuse, your trust levels are likely very low. While this can seem like a good thing in some ways, it could also hinder your future relationships. This issue may lead to other problems such as social anxiety. You might find yourself whether, wondering whether people are being truthful with you or if they are just manipulating your emotions to get what they want. You may become hypervigilant or overly sensitive to criticism or judgment from others due to the fear of being betrayed yet again. And that is a mechanism in your body that is trying to protect you. And there is some validity to it because people tend to have patterns in these relationships. And that's why, again, the healing work and the education are so important because that's what breaks the patterns and that's what allows you to attract and bring healthy, loving relationships into your life. Now, nobody's perfect. You got to show people grace, but you know that there's a line you cross where people are just being abusive and mean and, and hurtful. And you need to know where that line is for you and be very clear on that. People pleasing is another one. I would argue that this is a form of codependency or codependents tend to people please. A codependent is somebody who needs other people in order to be okay in other words, their self, um, their self image is based on what other people think of them. Their entire self image. We all care what other people think, but you should not be to the point that you can't walk away from somebody and not care what they think if they're causing you harm. You see what I'm saying? You may become a people pleaser or try to make people like you. You may become overly accommodating to get approval from others after having to walk on eggshells for so long. Keep in mind, you can be too nice. If somebody is treating you like crap and you're putting up with it and you're not speaking up or walking away or doing setting boundaries, that's too nice. So it's one thing to be nice and to be kind. It's another thing to be a doormat. And knowing the difference, sometimes there is a fine line. You show people grace. You are forgiving. But that doesn't mean that you put up with abuse. It says you might struggle with expressing your emotions and thoughts after narcissistic abuse because of the fear of being judged for what you say. To avoid confrontation from a narcissistic abuser, you likely bottled up your feelings. Not healthy. If you have a concern... If you have a desire, if you don't want to do something, or if you do want to do something and the other person's going against you, 
You have a right to express your feelings and your emotions about it. In a healthy relationship, you should be safe to be able to do that without feeling like somebody's going to fly off the handle, go in a rage, or completely shut you down. A good person does not do that. That doesn't mean you always agree. You'll disagree, and you'll even have arguments with people that you love, but you should feel safe being able to speak up when you know something's not right or when you don't want to do something. Keep that in mind as well. So setting boundaries is a good thing. Self-destructive habits is another one. Another effect of narcissistic abuse can be self-destructive habits. People who have been in relationship with narcs often feel the need to punish themselves because they feel as though they were at fault for their partner's bad behavior towards them. Again, that is so sad. They may have problems with addictions such as drinking, smoking, or even food addiction or overspending, any other kind of addiction as well. These addictions may be a way to numb emotional pain. And then it talks about how to heal from um, narcissistic abuse, which, good Lord, that's important, right? How to heal from narcissistic abuse. And I'm going to come back to that. I want to read some of these ways, and I've already given you a few solutions mixed in here with the impacts of narcissistic abuse. But um, I just wanted to add a little bit here about codependency. Codependency, I already told you what it was. But codependents basically people please, and they enmesh with people in relationships. And enmesh simply means that they don't have personal boundaries because their sense of personal identity is either weak or non-existent. Most codependents are good people. Most codependents have a conscience. Most codependents have high empathetic traits. And because of those traits they are more likely to be susceptible to narcissistic abuse because a narcissist for whatever reason, they have antennas that can detect that a thousand miles away and they will suck that person in through hoovering and love bombing. And that's why you end up with a lot of especially romantic relationships where you have the narcissist who is the energy vampire and then you have the empath who is the sweet, kind, submissive person who's the one being abused. I've seen this dynamic in my own life, even in very close places in my life and it is very sad but that's what happens with a codependent and if you want to learn more about codependency i would look up the work of lisa romano i've talked about her a lot she's had a large influence on my own healing journey now her teachings are not christian per se and there may be things in there that you don't agree with so use your discernment whatever you feel like you need to do but she's got some great youtube videos and great books and great meditations on codependency, on healing from codependency, on what codependency is and how you can get your life back. And another resource that I encourage you to look at when it comes to setting boundaries is Setting Boundaries by Henry Cloud. There's another guy that wrote it too, but uh, Setting Boundaries by Henry Cloud. I will put that in the show notes along with all these articles I'm referring to. Every single one of them will be in the show notes as well. You can refer to them. You can read the articles in their entirety. Also keep in mind... Um, I'm an English teacher, so I'm going to mention this. A lot of these articles, they use other sources to back up what they're saying, which is good. That increases their credibility. But um, if you go to the end, they'll have what's called a bibliography. A bibliography is just a list of sources that were used in crediting the information that they used in their article. If it's helpful, you may want to look at those bibliographies for the articles that really stand out to you and resonate with you and go look up the articles that they have in their bibliography to get even more information. So that's another hint on helping you find even more research on these topics, on all of these subtopics on narcissistic abuse, any that stand out to you especially. And the U YouTube, oh my gosh, there's just so much stuff on YouTube there. You got to be careful, but there's a lot of good stuff. Another resource I would recommend if you're trying to find some good teachers that teach about narcissistic abuse, go to my YouTube channel, Christian Emotional Recovery. Hit subscribe while you're there. There's a lot of, I'm putting up a lot of good stuff. Go to my YouTube channel, Christian Emotional Recovery, and click subscribe and find an article called, I can't remember the number I had, but it was YouTube channels or platforms that on narcissistic abuse, YouTube channels or platforms that I recommend. It's something like that anyway. And go watch that video and that gives you some great resources and you can use your discernment on which ones you feel are helpful and which ones are maybe for other people. Okay, 
So, but um, this all this research about codependency and about narcissistic abuse actually began when they started creating Alcoholics Anonymous and when children of alcoholics were suffering from abuse in those situations. And what they found was that the um, behaviors and the impacts of narcissistic abuse were very similar to those of alcoholics. So children and grandchildren of alcoholics are very similar in their situations as narcissistic abuse survivors and they've also found that there's some overlap there as well and so that's a little bit about where this research got started and Lisa Romano talks about that a lot as well um, so the next section is impacts of specific types of relationships with narcissists impacts of specific types of relationships with narcissists the first one is parent-child because I would argue that the two that impact people the most are parent-child or caretaker-child, if it's not a direct parent, and romantic relationships. Romantic relationships. So let's. there's an article here called 15 Ways Being Raised by a Narcissist Can Affect You. When I was talking about the impact of alcoholism and narcissistic abuse, I also forgot to mention that while I'm not going to go into any detail here, some of the qualities and traits of narcissists and alcoholics are similar. And I'm not going to go into those because we've already talked about some of the narcissistic traits. But I'll put the article. It's from Psych Central. It's from Psych Central. I will put that article in the show notes so you can read it if you find those. You want to find out more about those connections, especially if you have a history of alcoholism in your family, even if it's a couple of generations back, like I do in mine. Um, and then. I was also talking about um, complex trauma and how narcissistic abuse can impact and create complex trauma or CPTSD. So I will put an article in there by the CPTSD Foundation. That's a great organization. Check it out if you have complex trauma. CPTSDfoundation.org cptsdfoundation.org, but they have an article called Narcissistic Abuse and Complex Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. So it makes a connection between the two and helps you to understand it better. Complex trauma specifically, not just regular PTSD. Narcissistic Abuse and Complex Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder by the CPTSD Foundation. I'll also put that article in the show notes. Now, back to 15 ways being raised by a narcissist can affect you. I'm going to go through this quickly because there's a lot of information here, but this is by Dan Newharth, PhD, MFT. So he's got the qualifications. Dan Newharth wrote this article. It's in Psychology Today. And so it basically first starts talking about questions. Did these things happen to you? One or both of your parents do these different things to you? And a lot of these will sound familiar. I'm not even going to... Um, read them all, but I'll just pick a few random ones. Bestow gifts with strings attached. Tell you to trust them, then disappoint and betray you. That one sounds familiar to me. Criticize and undermine your decisions and choices. Forbid you to disagree with them or punish you for doing so. Discount or ridicule your emotions, wants, or needs. View situations in black and white, all or none terms. Seem hypersensitive to real or imagined slights. Act magnanimously to outsiders, but ignore your needs. I hate to say how familiar that sounds to me, but those are just a few, and you can read the whole list here. And then it talks about the 15 ways being raised by a narcissist can affect you. And these are connected to how um, the general impacts of narcissism, right? But I wanted to hone in on the parent-child or caretaker-child relationship because that one is when you're most vulnerable. It's when you don't know who's who and what's what. And you accept with open arms whatever you're taught, even if it's bad, even if it's a lie, even if it's wrong. And so here are some of the things that it can, can happen to you if you're raised by a narcissist. Find it difficult to let go, laugh, or be spontaneous. Feel undeserving. Get uncomfortable when good things happen. I know I have that one. Initially idealize people you meet, then inevitably feel let down by them. Feel anxious about confrontations with others. Struggle to feel close to others even when you want to. Please others at your own expense. 
feel drawn to turmoil rather than harmony in your relationships. And some of that is because your brain is addicted to that cortisol because that's what it's used to. And it takes some time to overcome that addiction because conflict creates more cortisol and that's what you're used to. So you, you have to get used to the peace. It takes some time. You may even feel bored at first, but some people are relieved too. So it's just something you have to work on. Number nine, judge yourself harshly. Number 10, self-soothe through excessive drink, food, shopping, or compulsive behaviors or other addictive behaviors. Number 11, trust others unwisely or conversely. Find it hard to even trust when you want to. Number 12, believe that dysfunction in relationships is normal and unavoidable. Feel numb or struggle to identify your feelings. View others as fragile or view yourself as too much to handle. And number 15, feel extra sensitive around entitled, arrogant, or manipulative people. And so then it goes into some strategies you can do to help you to recognize these things and to deal with them. And it says, recognize the past has come alive in the present because the thing about your brain, when you have those fight or flight responses, when your amygdala, which is that reactive lizard brain, gets activated, it doesn't know the difference that this isn't actually happening now versus it brought something up from the past that rec you recognize as being similar to something now. You see the difference? And so your brain doesn't know the difference and that's why you react that way. But as you learn to rewire your brain, your brain does begin to understand the difference. And that's why recognizing the past has come alive in the present is so important. Place responsibility and accountability correctly. That means if somebody is abusing you, that's not your fault. That's them, not you. Getting clear on setting boundaries, on what is healthy behavior, on what is acceptable behavior, on what is unacceptable behavior, on where you need to show people grace and on where enough is enough. Place responsibility and accountability correctly. Seek support. Ask yourself empowering questions such as, what is the best way to take care of myself in this situation? Is this how I want to treat myself or view others? Who do I want to be and what do I want to stand for right now? What would, how does God see me in this situation? I would argue, how does God see me in this situation is another good one. And then read scriptures that teach you that truth over and over and over again. Um, if all else fails and you are unsure what to do in any given situation, simply ask yourself what your parents might do in the same situation or may have told you to do. Then do the opposite. Now, that's not a disrespect to parents in general, and but we're talking about abusive parents that were narcissistic. Uh, chances are you won't go wrong by doing the opposite of a narcissist parent's self-serving advice or put-downs. That's an interesting one, but it kind of makes sense if you're, you've been in a really bad situation like that, actually. So, um, other family members, like siblings and other family members. I argue that if you had close family members that were not parents, that abused you or tormented you or um, had high narcissistic traits or were narcissistic and they treated you that way chronically when you were a child, it can have the same impact on you as if it were your parents or your caretakers. The people that impacted your brain and how you think, you modeled after them what they taught you to think about yourself. So you have to rewire all that crap if it was wired wrongly. You can do it though. You can do it. It takes time and it sucks. You shouldn't have to do all this work. You didn't do anything to deserve to have to do all this work. But the fact is, is that's what it is and that's where you're at. And so doing that healing work can allow you to have the life that God promised you. Another one is bosses and coworkers. Now, I kind of hesitated about sharing a personal story in this situation, but I want to share it because I want you to understand how impactful even a boss or a coworker relationship can be. I used to work in a department at a university, said university will go unnamed, but I worked there for 12 years. And I am convinced, there are people that will disagree with me on this, but I am convinced that a whole dynamic or group of people can be narcissistic. I've seen that in family dynamics. I've seen that in political parties. I've seen that in countries and governments. I've seen it in uh, organizations and in work environments. And I would argue that where I worked, while there were individuals in the department that were absolutely wonderful friends and kind and good and empathic people, I would argue that the overall dynamic of where I worked was narcissistic. 
And I would argue that I was a survivor of narcissistic abuse of that whole dynamic. Am I going to say that I never did anything wrong, that I reacted as well as I could have, or that I didn't make mistakes along the way? No, I'm not. I take responsibility for the fact that I made mistakes and bad mistakes sometimes and did not react as well as I could have in those situations. I was traumatized at the time. I didn't even know what PTSD or CPTSD was. And I had high ratings. As a professor, I had high ratings from my students. I wasn't perfect, but I had high ratings. And I survived five job cuts in the department. Five. And then I applied for um, promotion to try to work towards tenure seven times. Seven. I was denied tenure all seven times. I even went back to get another degree. I went to conferences. I got published. I self-improved. I did everything. Now, some of that was subjective and the people on the committees. And some of that, I believe, was the dynamic of that narcissism. And because I had high empathic traits, because I had CPTSD and displayed some symptoms of that, I believe I experienced discrimination in that department. Now, in terms of work environments and narcissism, um, we went through a lot of department chairs when I was there, probably six or seven. And there were like two or three that really liked me and I got along well with them and every, all was well when they were there. But there were others where it was not great. And then there was one that finally came in after being there 12 years, being turned down for promotion seven times, and after surviving five job cuts, still having hope, having gotten my terminal degree and gone into debt and taken the time and the energy to do that while teaching a 5-5 class load with 120 students, grading each individual paper, reading them bit by bit, and putting comments on every individual assignment, which is if you look at the research in English departments, is a gross, is literally twice a gross overwork of any employee. And I was making pennies. My benefits were good, but I was making pennies for what I was doing. I will just tell you straight up, I was making $30,000 a year and I was working 60 hours a week. Some of my chronic conditions are because I stayed there longer than I should have. And because I wasn't educated about this stuff, I didn't know that this was not right. I knew it wasn't right. I knew it wasn't right, but I didn't know that I deserved better. And I kind of did, but it's like on another level, I didn't. But the last straw for me was a man came to our department to apply for the position. And if you know anything about academia, you spend like two or three days. You tour the department. You give all kinds of lectures. You um, are interviewed by several people. And there's a lot of steps in becoming a department chair in an academic university setting. Well, this guy did all that. And he had me convinced. He, he, he talked to me. I went to the, the lunch to get to know him. And he just fit all the boxes. He checked all the boxes. He was nice. He was conscientious. And after some of the bosses we had had, I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy's great. And so there was hoovering and love bombing involved in a professional setting. I did not see any red flags. There was another lady that was the other candidate, and she was a single mom, and everybody's like, she won't be reliable. She won't be dependable. She said that she's always going to put her family first. That should have been, to me, a good sign. And the other guy should have been a red flag, right? Well, I didn't know that at the time because I, 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 wasn't, I didn't even know what narcissistic abuse was. I didn't know what narcissists were much less a psychopath. I would argue that this guy was a psychopath. Long story short, he came to the department and for the first couple of months, everything was okay, just like in any relationship. And he kept saying in the department meetings, I don't want you, this was his, these were his words, word for word, I don't want everybody in the department to be lockstep with each other and doing everything I'm doing and to be doing everything the same. But all of his actions started to contradict that. Now, with narcissists, they try to control you. They try to isolate you. At the time, for several years, I had been moving my classes to another building because they had better facilities. And quite frankly, I had a close friend who could hook me up. I had better um, projection, a better computer, and the, the, it was just a better setup. So I would go and move my classes, and nobody ever had a problem with that. No department chair ever disapproved of it. I got their permission, and, and I got the um, approval from, from the university, and I did it. 
He was the first person that said, you can't do that anymore. You've got to have your classes in this building. And our building was old, crusty, crowded, and there was barely enough classrooms to accommodate even if you started at 7 in the morning and went until 9 at night. But I had to come back to this old, crusty building that I used to teach in that had so many bad memories. So I did, and I dealt with it. Um, I talked to this guy, and one day I was talking to him. I went to talk to him about something, and he told me I had no merit as an instructor. Mind you, I had high teaching evaluations consistently, and he told me I had no merit as an instructor, and every other department chair I'd had before that had given me good or excellent evaluations. He said that word for word. You have no merit as an instructor. I had asked him about, well, I got my terminal degree. I was told to get my terminal degree in order to move up because I've done everything else and I have not been able to move up. He's like, nope, 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 nope. It doesn't work that way. So he goes and switches it on me, right? Um, he told me I have no merit as an instructor and he knew um, he had evaluated, he said he was going to observe and evaluate every instructor's teaching just to get an idea of how they were like. That's what he said. But he came to my classroom and my students were unusually uncooperative, shall we say. And I tend to be a mellow, laid-back teacher. I'm not a disciplinarian. I tend to be compassionate with my students. And I'm not a harsh grader. And, um, I could tell that that did not sit well with him. He wanted me to grade on a curve, and I didn't want to do it. I wanted to grade based on the grade that the students earned, regardless of what it was. Again, he said, I'm not in lockstep. But when some of the students were acting up, um, he told me that I was not um, handling that situation the way I should have. Basically, when we were in staff meetings, he would get in arguments with people and he would shut them down and cut them down. And I didn't do that when we were in the classroom. If they would disagree with me, I'd be like, okay, well, tell me more about that or something like that. And he observed that as being a weakness. And then when I didn't give um, C's to 60% to of my students, he perceived that as a weakness. Yet he had said, I don't want you to be in lockstep with the way I am. But he was one of those people that would just dominate and tear into people if he disagreed with them out in the open. And I didn't do that in my classroom. Well, um, that's when, like I said, after he evaluated me and I talked to him and I was asking him some questions, he told me I had no merit as an instructor. It absolutely devastated me. And it was 10 minutes before I had a class and he knew I had a class. He told me that... And I wouldn't say this if it was just anybody, but these kind, he was a psychopath. He wasn't just a narcissist. He was a psychopath. I actually watched him target people in the department like me that were quiet, that were empaths, that were more emotional type people, that were more introverted. And he, were, he gave them a hard time. He put them at the bottom of the totem pole. And the people that were narcissistic and aggressive and loud, he gave them the high positions and uh, praised them and made them feel good. And... One reason I know this for sure is because when I was, um, we always got assigned to teach summer classes, and summer classes were a commodity. There weren't enough to go around for everybody. But I had already been assigned one summer class, and I had been there for, mind you, 12 years. 12 years. He took my class away from me after it had been given it to me and gave it to a new faculty member that he had handpicked himself. That's how much power he had. And then after he came to, after he said that to me in his office, I went to my classroom and I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to teach. I was about to cry. I had never cried in front of my students. I had come close. I had been teaching 12 years. You know, things happen. I bet I'd never cried. And um, I, I just stood in front of my, my students and I just... I said, I just had the most horrible experience. And I didn't tell them a lot, but I was basically in tears. And I looked at the doorway of my classroom. They have like this window in them. And he was standing there. He had followed me to my classroom to see how I was going to react. And he actually put me in that position knowing that I would react that way because he knew that I was an empath and an emotional person. He had actually calculated that. Why would he have followed me to my classroom otherwise? He never did that with anybody. And so he, um, I, I told my students, I said, I can't stay here. I said, I'm very, I feel very sick. I didn't tell him anything else. And I left. 
I said, I can't teach today. I'm sorry. And I went home. And I, I reflected on it a little bit. And I went and talked to the dean. I talked to the dean. The dean didn't care. He wouldn't do anything about it. He said he's the department chair. He can do whatever he wants. And looking back, I should have gone to HR. I should have made a legal made it a legal issue. I didn't. Again, I didn't know what I know at the time. And I was scared to lose my job. But at that point, I knew I wasn't going to keep my job anyway. So I told the guy, I said, if you will um, make it where I quit instead of I'm released from my job, make it look that way on paper, I will quit it, so I can get um, unemployment while I look for something else. And after trying to talk to my department, uh, I meant my dean, and him not caring at all, that was the end of 12 years at a university that I loved, even though I'd had a lot of hard experiences there. And so that's just an example of the fact that bosses and coworkers can have a very big impact on your mental health. And I'm still, to this day, dealing with the health issues of that fallout and of overworking myself to death because I put up with that abuse for so long in that narcissistic department. And when I left the department, I'd been there 12 years. I had a few personal close friends there. Some had come, some had gone, and some were still there. I sent out a goodbye email to the department. I didn't say anything about what had happened. I just said I was moving on to other things. And I had one response out of the entire department. One. There were 65 people in that department, and I got one goodbye. One. After being there for 12 years. So you can tell me whether or not you think that that was a narcissistic department. And, you know, if you've been following my podcast for a long time, I'm a flawed person. I'm not perfect. But I generally get along with people and I generally have a good relationship with people wherever I go. And I've never had an experience like that before or since. And, you know, I believe you can vouch for my character to know that it wasn't me that had some serious issue, but the department dynamic was that messed up. Like I said, I made mistakes. I didn't always react well. I was reacting with PTSD and anger. I'll admit that. But I had a lot of good relationships in that department. But when it was all said and done, nobody gave a crap. And when I left, nobody gave a crap. And that's why I just wanted to say that in work situations and in organizations, whole organizations in some cases can be narcissistic. Family dynamics that try to maintain the false image of the family is just like a narcissist, but it's on a dynamic level. And I want to talk about this in another podcast, but I don't want to get into politics too much because I don't want to offend anybody, but I see that happening in our country too. And I'm just going to leave it at that, but it can happen on a whole group of people, a whole dynamic like that. Um... So that's just a little bit about bosses and coworkers. Clergy and authority figures are another one. I'm not going to get into detail because after sharing that story, I think that's enough. And one of the um, topics that I'm going to talk about more is religious abuse, especially in a Christian podcast and YouTube channel that needs to be addressed. So I'm not going to get into details here. But there's an article called Narcissist, God, and Religion from Mental Health Center. And I will include that in the show notes so you can at least get some context on how religious leaders will often hide behind a false image. And it's even more dangerous and it's even more difficult to pick those people out than in a work or a political setting because of the whole nature of faith and religion and spirituality and one another quick note one resource i would encourage you to check out is the rise and fall of mars hill podcast it's controversial it's put out by christianity today but it does give you some context of how people can unquestioningly trust a religious leader give him the benefit of the doubt just because he's a preacher and then he abuses and leaves a path of destruction in his wake because there's no accountability because there's no transparency, and because um, people just, it's the same dynamic as you see in families and in organizations and at work. So just beware, okay? Partners and spouses is another one, and this is a whole other can of worms because that in itself has had a thousand books written about it, understandably. 
and it's probably the most common and impactful relationship with narcissistic abuse besides family dynamics. The signs, impacts, and harms can be the same, but they also have their own special brand of manipulation and control. One of them is sexuality because in most relationships, at least hopefully, sexuality doesn't directly come into play as it does with a marriage or a partner relationship. So I want to show you this section a little bit about narcissistic abuse. What are the warning signs in a relationship? Namely, a romantic relationship ship a romantic relationship again these are similar to the ones you saw before they're super charming they're super charming and they do the love bombing and it happens really really fast super charming love bombing really really fast and keep in mind this can be marriages non-marriages it can be gay relationships it can be straight relationships whatever your opinion is about any of those things this is not new, just in heterosexual relationships this is not just in uh, romantic relationships and it's not just in exclusive relationships it can be in any kind of intimate relationship like that they're extremely controlling is one of the signs they try to isolate you from friends and family They'll make you dependent on them. They lie. They gaslight you. You always feel like you are in the wrong. They never apologize or say sorry, or they say sorry strategically, meaning they have a, an apology that's not an apology. Another resource I would recommend on that, also from my YouTube channel, I just happen to have some of these topics already covered in my YouTube channel. So, if you want to know more about whether an apology is genuine or not, I would include, I would look at the dangers of denial. The dangers of denial. That's one of the YouTube videos that I put up on Christian Emotional Recovery, the YouTube channel. It's called The Destructive Power of Denial and What to Do About It. And one of the parts of denial that... I talk about is the fake apology or the apology with a lot of concessions, a lot of hedging. A genuine apology has specific steps to it and specific actions. And if all of those steps and actions are not present, then that apology is not sincere. And that's one of the warning signs here. They never apologize or they say sorry strategically. So if you want to know more about what saying sorry strategically is, check out that YouTube video that I will include in the show notes. And if I don't, just go look at my YouTube channel and look up The Destructive Power of Denial and What to Do About It under Christian Emotional Recovery. Other things, they destroy your self-confidence. You doubt everything. Those are some of the signs of narcissistic abuse in a, an intimate or romantic relationship. So that's a breakdown of that. That's a breakdown of that. And there are different other types of relationships, but those are some of the main ones. There's an article here by Laura Dorwart. Laura Dor Dorwart. And this is from VeryWellHealth, VeryWellHealth.com, Narcissistic Personality Disorder Types. And I'll put the article in the show notes, Narcissistic De personality disorder types. Now, just a real quick thing. If you want to really get into detail about types of narcissists, how to identify them and their differences and their traits, there are a lot of different definitions of types of narcissists. But I'm just going to stick to the basics here. But one resource I would recommend is Dr. Ramani. R-A-M-I-N R-A-M-A-N-I, R-A-M-A-N-I, Dr. Ramani, she's got a YouTube channel, and she, just Google her and type in YouTube and type in types of narcissist Dr. Ramani, and you will get all kinds of great tools and resources, and she breaks it down even more if you're interested. So types of narcissists, uh, some of the types of narcissists are overt, one is overt, and that's called agentic narcissism. I haven't heard of that. Overt, but is what you might think of as the classic or most obvious form of NPD. Someone experiencing overt narcissism is excessively preoccupied with how others see them. They're overly focused on status, wealth, flattery, and power due to their grandiosity and sense of entitlement. Many overt narcissists are high achieving and deeply sensitive to criticism no matter 
house light. And that's out in the open. That's why it's called overt. Overt, it means out in the open. The ones you've got to look out for, the ones that are harder and trickier to spot are covert narcissists. I would, I have more respect for an overt narcissist because at least what you see is what you get. With an overt narcissist, the victims can often be traumatized even more because the flying monkeys and the people around them don't believe when they say what's going on. And that is probably worse than the abuse itself. But a covert narcissist also known as a closet narcissist or a vulnerable narcissist, isn't as obvious as an overt narcissist. Like other people with NPD, someone with covert narcissism has an inflated sense of self-importance and craves admiration from others. However, someone living with covert narcissism might display more subtle and passive negative behaviors. Rather than bragging about themselves or demanding respect, they might engage in blaming, shaming, manipulation, or emotional neglect to get what they want and keep the focus on themselves. They also might see themselves as a victim. I would argue, though, that a covert narcissist does things in hiding. So they might treat you like gold and speak highly of you to your mutual friends and family and out in public and then shame you and blame you and abuse you and neglect you in private and so they act two different ways. And when they're super charming to everybody else and then treat you like dirt in private, they're not going to, people are not going to believe you when you say that that person is that way. That's why it's important to provide proof. Covert narcissists are the ones you need to look out for. And then antagonistic narcissist. Antagonistic narcissist. While all people with narcissistic traits might ov be overly concerned with how they appear to others, antagonistic narcissists are particularly concerned with coming out on top. So everything's about them. Everything's about winning. Everything's about competitiveness. I actually dated a guy like this, so I know what that is like. Antagonistic narcissism is defined as a sense of competitiveness, arrogance, and rivalry. They're the kind of sharks that'll cut you down and then laugh at you when they cut you down. A communal narcissist. These are another one that's subtle that you have to look out for. It's not what they do, it's how they do it you have to look for. A communal narcissist is like someone living with a covert narcissist, someone experiencing communal narcissism might not appear to be ego-driven at all. They might initially come across as selfless or even a martyr. It's messed up, but you know there's something not right with them. It says, but their internal motivation is to earn praise and admiration, not help others. Now, that's not the end of it. There's a lot of people that help other people, but also want some recognition. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. But they actually will act benevolent in public and then abusive in private, kind of like the covert narcissist, but their game is about humanitarian type stuff. So that's where people in the church can be communal narcissists, and you have to be really, really careful. To that end, these people often place themselves at the forefront of social causes or communities, usually as the leader or the face of a movement. People with communal narcissism see themselves as more empathetic, caring, or selfless than others and often display moral outrage. But actually, deep down in their core, they have none of those things and they are capable of none of those things. It's all fake. Malignant narcissism. Now, also keep in mind that you can combine some of these. For example, you can have a covert malignant narcissist. Yeah, I know. That's dangerous. Malignant narcissism is often seen as the most severe and potentially abusive form of NPD. Someone with malignant narcissism has the same egocentric self-absorption and sense of superiority as other narcissists. They also have traits associated with antisocial personality disorder, ASPD, such as aggression, paranoia, and lack of empathy. They might even have a sadistic streak. So I would argue that these people are the ones that can be the most cruel, malicious, and vicious, and they are the ones that will actually enjoy watching people in pain. They will actually torture people and enjoy it. And I am a survivor of a lifelong person who had that kind of condition. They are very sick, it's very sad, and it is the most sadistic form of mental or emotional abuse you can survive. Adaptive narcissism versus maladaptive narcissism. It's also important to recognize that not all people with NPD look, act, or behave the same way. 
For a per for example, a person with MPD might be very well dressed, charming, overachiever who cultivates a certain image to impress others, and other people may not have that appearance. Um, and then it talks about treatment, diagnosis, outlook, and you can read all that. But I just wanted you to know some of the most common types of narcissists and what to look out for. Especially look out for the communal narcissist, the covert narcissist, and the malignant narcissist. And the combination that is the worst is a communal malignant narcissist or a covert communal narcissist or a communal, a covert malignant narcissist. Any combination of two or three of those is bad. Believe me, I know. So, how to protect yourself. Um, we talked about some of the ways to do that in some of the previous sections. For example, gray rocking, going no contact and going low contact are a couple of ways. Um, no contact is when you cut somebody off from your life completely. No phone calls, no social media, no texting, no... Um, messaging, no mail, no nothing. You cut yourself off from them completely. You don't visit them. You don't see them at all. In the case of people that are extreme and extremely cruel and vindictive and abusive, that might be what you have to do. And that's okay. If that's what you have to do, that's okay. Some people will argue, if you honor your parents, you can't do that. Yeah, but if you enable people to have that kind of behavior, are you really honoring them? There are a lot of resources that talk about that, so I encourage you to check those resources out. I don't have a list, but just look it up and see what kind of literature is out there. Sometimes, yes, you have to set boundaries even with parents and with family. Um, no contact in some cases. In other cases, it may be no contact for a period of time until you can get yourself straightened out and then low contact. Low contact is where maybe instead of visiting every month, you visit every six months. Maybe instead of a phone call every other day, a phone call every two weeks. So low contact is where maybe it's one of those higher functioning narcissists. They're still vindictive. They're still mean, but maybe you can negotiate with them and they're not the worst of the worst. The worst of the worst, where you get into sociopathy and psychopathy, that's where you probably have to go no contact. That is a judgment call. That's where you have to pray. That's where you have to get God's um, insight. That's where you need to get a counselor to help you figure that out. That's where you need to use your own insights and pray about it and give it time and see what works the best. But don't let anybody ever guilt you into having contact with or relationship with somebody, no matter what the relationship is, out of obligation, because, well, there you're this, and well, there you're that. Well, you know what? If you're in a mental institution, if you're on antidepressants, if you have chronic health conditions, if you're suicidal because of that person in your life, you cannot be in relationship with that person. So don't let anybody guilt trip you. Don't let the flying monkeys manipulate you because they will come for you. Don't believe them. You have to use your own judgment and don't apologize to anybody for taking care of yourself, for setting healthy boundaries, and for doing what you need to do to restore your mind and your body as Christ intended the life for you to live. You can heal from narcissistic abuse. That's why a sustained daily practice can help you heal from narcissistic abuse. Videos, education from YouTube and courses, meditation, EFT, somatic and body work, scripture on who you are in Christ to counter all the crap that those people and the lies they put in your head, journaling, prayer, scripture, affirmations, inner child work, EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprogramming, um, you can do that with a therapist, IFS, which is Internal Family Systems. It's another form of therapy you can do with a therapist. Music, body therapies, art, and somatic therapies, grounding, and the list goes on. But do find what works for you and keep doing the healing work. You will reprogram your mind, get the trauma out of your body, from the body, find out where that trauma came from, find out where the narcissistic abuse started, find out where it was and what happened and what it did to your mind and what it taught you about what you believe and go through all that stuff to come back out the other side so you can get that stuff out of your neural network and live the life you deserve. 
having a daily practice where you're consistent, whether you do something for 15 minutes a day, if that's what you can do, or two hours a day will make a difference. The more focused you are on healing, the quicker you will heal. That means the healing itself, not just the concept of healing, but the work itself. Understanding what happened to you, why it happened to you, and releasing the trauma from your body will help you heal as well. Also, check out episode 7 of season 1 from the podcast for more of an understanding on overcoming and healing narcissistic abuse as well. I think that... I think that that episode will help you. Check out episode 7 of season 1, and that will give you more insight on understanding, overcoming, and healing narcissistic abuse. But that's it for this episode. This episode is part 2 of series on narcissistic abuse, what you need to know about narcissistic abuse. So this is... Season 2, Episode 7, What You Need to Know About Narcissistic Abuse, Part 2, in the series on narcissistic abuse. So that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. I know that this two-part episode in this two-part series, I know this two-part episode in this series on narcissistic abuse was long. So thank you for going on this journey with me. Hopefully it educated you or maybe refreshed you a little bit on narcissism and narcissistic abuse. What it is, how it starts, who has it, the traits of it, impacts on victims and survivors, and how you can get your life back. That's the whole point of all of this is getting your life back and living the life that God intended for you to have. Remember you are loved and you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Not my words, God's. And also, check out my YouTube channel, which is called Christian Emotional Recovery. I'm trying to put out an episode about every two weeks as I'm able and as my health permits. And also, check out my Facebook group, also called Trauma Survivors Unite Christian Emotional Recovery. Trauma Survivors Unite Christian Emotional Recovery. Check out ChristianEmotionalRecovery.com, which is the website where you can sign up for email list. I haven't gotten that started, but I will be getting it started as soon as I'm able. Again, thank you so much for sticking with me and listening. This was the first part in a series on narcissistic abuse, and it was two episodes, which were season two, episodes six and seven. Check out episode six if you haven't to get the rest of this part of the series, and we will be doing some more episodes about the impacts of narcissistic abuse in different environments. So check those out and those will be out in a few weeks. Stay tuned for those. It's been wonderful talking to you today and have a great day. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Christian Emotional Recovery hosted by Rachel Leroy. For links to this week's resources and to join the discussion, check out this episode's show notes at christianemotionalrecovery.com where you can also find links to our YouTube channel and Facebook group. Join our email list and get other episodes and resources. If you enjoyed the podcast, please rate and review the podcast and tell a friend who may benefit from this message. See you next time. And remember, beloveds, God loves you, and you are fearfully and wonderfully made.